Um, my name is Jessica Weiss. I'm the executive director of Growing Soul, which is a nonprofit uh, focused on nine initiatives and making sure that they are all integrated so that we have a truly sustainable food system. And I'm going to be brief because I want to get to our panelists and a lot of questions from the audience. So with that, I'm going to let each of the panelists actually introduce themselves um, because they can do it better than I can. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to start actually with Lan. <laughs> so I know she's at the part. So uh, this is Caroline Taylor with Montgomery Countryside Alliance. Can you hear me? Say no if you can. All right, hi, I'm Caroline Taylor. I'm executive director for Montgomery Countryside Alliance. First question, and I don't have any prizes. Does anybody know what the ag county's agricultural reserve is? All right, that's not bad, that's not bad. For those of you that don't, there, the county set aside in 1981 about a third of this county, 106,000 acres for the purpose of farmland and farming preservation and open space preservation. It was and remains a national model for agricultural preservation. That's the good news. There's more good news. We have launched with the county, uh, several of us, something called the New Farm Pilot Project, where we are training new farmers to get on the ground here in Montgomery County and the region to grow the food that ends up on our table and grow it sustainably. Among other farmers, we have someone who's growing persimmons, which are apparently very healthful for you and in demand. We also have a restaurateur who's growing on property here and supplying to local restaurants. Another piece of good news, uh, two years ago we launched Landlink Montgomery and that connects farmers with land because we identified the number one challenge to farming here in this region, access to affordable land. We have now uh, this year included 235 new acres in farming as part of this program with small sustainable farming including a business in um, uh, Frederick County that came to Montgomery County. South Mountain Creamery now has farmland in Montgomery County. We also have a ginseng farmer who is farming in woodland, minimally invasive farming. And we also have uh, someone doing microgreens and, uh, and food for Asian uh, restaurants and, uh, and stores. So how about the bad news, because you knew that was coming, and that is the statistic, the sobering statistic that every minute of every day, we lose one acre of farmland in this country. In Montgomery County, we're bucking that trend. We're adding acreage. And we're adding acreage, just as Janet said, without taking down trees and, do and people farming sustainably, low water usage, new methodology. I'll give a shout out to Matt Rails and Grass Essentials, who are, uh, have pasture-raised, uh, perennial grass-based, uh, livestock grazing that if anybody wants to see healthy animal poop, I'll take you to go see that. And that may not sound exciting to you, but I got to tell you in the scheme of things environmentally, it's pretty exciting. The other piece of bad news is the average age of farmers in the country is 57 and in Montgomery County it's 59. And unless we start getting people on the ground learning, give them the skills that they need, we're going to be in a heap of trouble. And we're going to be in a heap of trouble obviously globally. But here in a county that now has a million people, we have to do more. So our national model is great, but we have a lot more to do, and I'm sure the other panelists will talk more about that. There were several things, if anyone was here when Reverend Yearwood and the panel spoke previously, that people said that I thought were important. One was community building. We're all in our own silos. We like to say silos. And <laughs> what this type of event does is it brings us out of our silos so we can see what each of us are doing, what concerns us most, and how we can address each of the problems that we have and take advantage of the assets. The fact is this county has more assets than it has problems. We absolutely do. I'm going to quote Wendell Berry because I like to. And I'm going to quote him twice. The first thing is eating is an agricultural act. And unless we can embrace that, we also have a problem. And in this county, one of our problems is we're afraid of food and how it's grown. We're now, uh, we had taken a step forward to allowing people, for example, to raise chickens in their backyards under certain circumstances. So urban farming took a step forward, and now we're at the point where we're going to take a step backwards because there's some fear of chickens. 
I hope we can educate people not to be afraid of how our food is grown, and I hope that everyone takes away from this event today what you can do as a consumer in terms of demanding local food. Go in the Safeway, go in the Giant, go in some of the other stores and ask them what's truly local. Because I went in a store yesterday and they said local, had a big sign that said local. It was from California. <laughs> So I think, you know, while that definition is a little loosey-goosey, I think you'll all agree California is not low. So I don't want to take up any more time. I want to pass it along. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're just going in order of the food system, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we start with the land, and then we're going to move to farmers and farmers markets with Red uh, If you'd like to, sure. <laughs> I'm going to sit. I'm sure it's hard for me to see everybody sit. Right. Uh, well, first off, I want to thank Silver Spring Green for having, for having me here and for being part of our farmer's market today. Um, my name is Reg Godin. I'm director uh, of markets and programs with Fresh Farm Markets. And we run 11 producer-only farmer's markets. One of them, our most favorite, is here um, on Saturday mornings in downtown Silver Spring. Um, as an organization, we run, uh, like I said, we run 11 farmers markets. We have over 85 uh, farmers coming from five states that sell in our 11 markets. We have over 35 artisanal producers that um, use local and feature local ingredients in their products. Um, and, uh, and along with that, we also have five um, public benefiting programs that we run. Um, one is our gleaning program, where at each market we partner with a uh, a food bank here in Silver Spring is Shepherd's Table. So at the end of the market, they come and they glean whatever wasn't able, wasn't able to be sold. Um, so sometimes uh, at the peak of the year, it can be up to 500, 600 pounds of fresh produce that goes right to the food bank and, and right to the needy. So it's a great program that, that we run. Um, another program that we run is the Shepherd Market Program, which is to help educate uh, the shoppers how to use seasonal ingredients in, in their um, regular uh, cooking lifestyle. Um, Excuse me, I, I locked my keys in my car, so everything is out of my head here. So <laughs> I left my notes in there. Um, uh, along with that, we also have a matching dollars program. Um, this is one of our, um, at Silver Spring, it's, it's, it's actually the most successful where shoppers on, on SNAP or WIC or, or senior coupons can come to the market and we will match up to $15 each market day at six of our markets. And at, here at Silver Spring last year, we gave away over $20,000. So that was over $40,000 of of low-income shopping that we were able to support at Silver Spring. So it's a, it's a great program that we're able to run. And uh, last but not least, we also run the Farmer Fund program where we provide scholarships to farmers in our system to go to off-season conferences and to, to, you know, to own their crafts and just to, to get better as farmers. Um, you know, I'm going to go off when, uh, Caroline's last, her, her quotes here, uh, which I think is really important, is uh, Wendell Berry's eating is an agricultural act. And actually, when I was in college, the University of New Hampshire, my professor, uh, John Carroll, he kind of modified that a little bit and we had a similar symposium and it was eating is a moral act. And I, I really find that to be true and I, I think that's at the heart of, of what we're doing here, and especially with fresh farm markets, um, is that we're, we're creating a lifestyle, you know, it's a choice. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing where, where change is going to happen. Um, you know, it's not, it, this market wouldn't be here in Silver Spring if it wasn't for the whole community. And, you know, we talked about community building, but, you know, it started with Peterson Company. You know, the market, if anyone remembers, back in 2005, we were down here in Ellsworth, and it was, you know, this little podunk market that wasn't really doing that well. And then, you know, we said, well, if we could move it up 200 feet, you know, we think it would do a lot better. And Peterson agreed, and, you know, we were able to do that and it was with their support. And then, you know, we kept gaining support, and then, and then you, kept, you started to see the people come, and, and, you know, you get to know them, and, you know, we're here today and having conversations. That's what we get to do every day at the farmer's markets, and, you know, we have a saying at, at, in our organization that the farmer's market is a new town square, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it really is, and it, it's great to be out there with your community, but it really is, you know, it takes a whole community to support the markets. You know, we have market in 8th Street that is a quarter of the size of this, of this market, and, you know, eighth of the size of our DuPont Circle Market, and it's just as successful because the community knows that they have to go there, and they have to talk to every farmer, and they have to, you know, how you doing, you know, how's the business, how's the farm, and then they buy from each and every person because they know if they want the market there, that's the kind of support that you have to have. So it's great to hear everything about community building, community support, because fundamentally that's where it's at, and it's a lifestyle. So 
Um, that's all I have. Great. Hello, I'm James Ricciuti. I'm the owner and chef of Ricciuti's Restaurant. We're in Albany, Maryland, um, which is right outside the Agricultural Reserve. Um, we've been in the area for just over 20 years as a restaurant, and we really embraced the local movement in the past 10 or 15. Um, just let me give you a little history. We started out in, in Laytonsville, Maryland, in uh, 1992 with a small pizza with five pizza and sandwich place. And um, my wife is in the audience. We were just out of college. <laughs> And I was about 25, I guess, or so. But we would have, being in the Agricultural Reserve in Laytonsville, which was a town of 200 people at the time, um, which has grown significantly, but we would have customers drop off tomatoes, greens. Um, we had a guy in town who made his own sausage. And this is the early 90s, probably kind of the beginning of the local movement where um, we kind of didn't realize that, hey, we're doing local food. So fast forward to... Uh, about 2000, we're in, we had moved from six miles down the road to the Olney House. It's a 200-year-old home in Olney, Maryland, which we occupy the whole place. Um, we have uh, two floors, five dining rooms, 100 plus seats. So we really started to concentrate on buying local. Um, two reasons, and the first reason really is, from a chef's point of view, is quality and taste. I mean, when we're getting the food fresher, it tastes better. Okay, and. We're just like, wow, this isn't traveling across the country. So we really made an effort to focus on buying as much local as we could. And we had a few farms two, three miles away from the restaurant, providing very little food. Um, so we bought as much as we could, like I said before. We focused on vegetables first, and then we started moving towards more, I guess, animal protein and fish sustainability. Um, so through the years, we searched out as much local beef as we could, chicken, um, fish, all from the Chesapeake Bay region, or Chesapeake watershed, or whatever. And then we looked at what we were doing, and we kind of said, hey, let's kind of look at it from a more sustainable point of view. And I think what's really important is as far as health and sustainability and, and how we take care of ourselves. So we really started to focus on more on pasture raised animals so we're almost 100 percent grass-fed beef in our restaurant i found a local farmer up in um, new windsor maryland in carroll county who had 300 head of uh cattle 100 percent on organic pasture raised beef and he was able to provide us with um, the amount of food that we would need to keep something consistent on our menu we only buy our seafood from the chesapeake bay um, not only i would say about 90 percent of what we buy Crab meat, for example, it's been a non-existent year for Maryland crab meat for whatever reason. They're not really sure, I don't know, because last year was great. The harvest levels were up from the early 90s, and this year it's been real bad. Um, so we haven't had crab meat on our menu this year, uh, which has been kind of for a restaurant in Maryland, you almost have to have some type of crab cake. Um, now, meat, and I'll get to this point. It's available, but it's not available at a price that we could sell at our restaurant, make money, and stay in business. So, and that's kind of the big challenge, which I'm going to get to next, of buying local for us. Um, we have to source out our food at a price, you know, that we can stay in business with. Um, we make every effort to do that, and we have to have a market for that also. We live in a very affluent area. Our restaurants in Albany, Maryland. So we have people that are willing to pay a premium price for, I guess I'll say clean food, non-GMO, mostly organic. We don't use any high fructose corn syrup in any of our products. Um, Chef-driven menus that require a lot of labor to produce and to serve. So that's one of the sad things, I guess, about you know the whole local thing is it is more expensive for the general population. Um, and we make every effort to sell our food at a fair price while still have a viable, sustainable business. Um, I guess uh, I, I kind of get off track, so this is really my first speaking engagement. <laughs> so, but um, I want to get back to the, the healthy part of eating too. So we, we eliminated clean food, like I, I like to call, was mostly organic, because we do use some food that has been treated with pesticides, but more from an integrated pest management point of view, 
where you know they use just what's necessary so the farmers can have a sustainable business. Um, so we take a focus on that. Like I said, non-GMO as much as possible, which is kind of controversial on some levels, I guess. But we had a demand for people looking for that. Um, also, uh, like I mentioned before, high fructose corn syrup. We're taking out all those empty calories out of our food. We're also really, really big on looking at the whole plate as far as portion size. So we found that the customer de demand has gotten away from those cheesecake factory mega portions of food. People want to eat where they're comfortable. They won't want to walk out of their restaurant feeling bad. So, um, and we've really kind of promoted that a lot along with the local aspect too. So people can come in, they can get, it might have cream in it, it might have eggs and a lot of cheese, but not where it's, that's the, um, like overriding ingredient in a lot of things. And the same thing I mentioned, as uh, Janet mentioned with beef, we've kind of switched our focus to where beef isn't always, or any meat really, and we're doing as much as possible. And I think you find this in a lot of other cul cultures, beef isn't like, or meat, isn't like the main part of the meal. It's just another ingredient, okay, which you see in a lot of Asian cultures um, where it's cut up really small and it's mixed in, but it's proportionally there might be more vegetables in a dish than there is meat. So, and that's a good way to, to keep your calories and or your, um, your, uh, your nutritional value up. So, I don't know. <laughs> we're doing what we can, um, and we're getting a really good response from the community. Uh, Montgomery County, we're super fortunate to be in it. I, w I will say that we are doing a lot of business with a lot of younger farmers. Um, there are a lot of kids coming out of college that are kind of uh, wetting their feet in the whole agricultural um, world and seeing that, hey, this is something that I want to do. And then, you know, find out it's very, very hard to be a farmer, probably <laughs> harder than anything else <laughs> in the world. And then, I don't know if, we, if you're going to talk about, I guess another big challenge is, is distribution, too, for us, you know, getting um, the food to us because we don't really have time to go to 20 different farms, you know, almost every day of the week and go pick up food. So there's farmers out there, they want to sell their food, but getting it to a restaurant tour is a big challenge. I would also add in that um, when James talks about local food, he's talking hyper-local. Many of the farms are within five miles of the restaurant. And what I love every time I come, which is quite frequently, um, <laughs> we do the composting services for, for Jay. Um, it always at the bottom of the menu says, you know, thank you to Sarah for her tomatoes and Tom for his eggs. And it really is, it's such a center of the community um, that I don't even think about the money that I'm spending there because I know it's not like your prices are that much different than a, than a I mean, than Chipotle for that matter. Yeah. And it's a gathering spot. And um, anyway, just wanted to throw that in there as well. Um, and next we have, we have Brett uh, Myers, who is working on keeping the cycle going. Well, no one else uses speech. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Brett Myers. I'm the founder of Nourish Now. And uh, I used to live in Laytonsville, and I used to go to Rakuji's yeah. <laughs> back in 92. Um, so it's 2013, and you know, our cell phones can do almost anything, but um, there's still 50 million people that are hungry in this country. Um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and, and I, I researched it. I, I used to work at Panera Bread, and I saw a lot of food go to waste there. But online, I found that they were doing a donation program, where at the end of the night, they took uh, the nonprofits picked up food from uh, Panera Bread and donated it to people in need. So I had the idea to start Nourish Now. We collect unused fresh food from restaurants, caterers, and other food providers and redistribute it to those in need throughout the county. Um, it's been about two and a half years since I started it. We've donated over 150,000 pounds of food. Um, <laughs> we've met some really amazing people in the community. We, we have a few different programs. We pick up uh, food, like I said, from restaurants and catering companies and redistribute it. 
Uh, we work with several different restaurants, now we're cooties, um, having a, a restaurant night where we allow families to come in to a restaurant and have a free meal in the house. It's fantastic for the restaurants to do that and it gives a family a nice uh, night out. We also um, partner with several different uh, nonprofits to work on collaboration and, and try to uh, solve you know, the issue of not just hunger in Montgomery County, but food waste as a whole. Uh, Grown Soul, Jessica and I have been working for a little while now. Um, she's rescued a lot of uh, produce from farms and have gotten it to nourish now and we've been able to redistribute it to those in need. We're working on a collaboration where Nourish Now would get food for uh, served to the people and Growing Soul would do composting uh, to serve you know, farm animals and enrich the soil. Um, we're also making about a commercial kitchen where food that, yes, 100%, uh, <laughs> where food that maybe isn't good enough to give to people directly but is still fresh that can be cooked in a commercial kitchen. People can come um, all, all throughout the community, help cook that and redistribute it uh, to those in need. I, I, I just been overwhelmed of like what I've seen from the community. You know, I started Nourish Now completely grassroots and um, it's grown. We, we have over 50 food donors uh, from Mama Lucia's to Cava restaurants to Quench to Not Your Average Joe's to Ridgewall Catering and um, we just got a new location in Rockville and we're really looking to grow and do our best to not only just like I said end hunger in Montgomery County but end food waste. I think it's something that we can do in this country. They say there's 96 billion pounds of food wasted each year. 75 billion of that is edible. That's just not good. That's not good. We can we can all make a difference. And you know, thank you. I'm glad to be here and love to answer any questions. Thanks. Okay. So I and I wanted to add that on top of this, we um, we have started. Uh, Caroline and I co-founded a um, the food council for Montgomery County. And we are currently seeking to add more um, council members. We are a grassroots organization, and our goal is to get people connected to their food. So we have working groups. Uh, the bulk of our work happens in working groups that are open to the public. We have working groups on healthy eating, on food access, on food recovery. Now we have a new one. Um, on land use zoning and planning, which is a big one that we're focusing on right now, because we're in a big zoning way right here. And the goal is to get people together. So we have a public meeting. Our next public meeting is going to be at Pastor Mark's church, uh, November 6th, to discuss uh, food and faith. And the first hour is kind of, you know, having a panel, panel discussion. And then the next 45 minutes, we have time for the working groups to get together and discuss whatever they want to work on. We're always open to opening new um, uh, working groups. Uh, Councilman Le Leventhal actually suggested that we have a new working group on backyard chickens for those of you who are interested. Uh, we just want to encourage people to engage and cross promote and when the working groups come across something that is an obstacle for them, that's when the council kind of comes in as a council to be able to advise and look at policy and any regulations that we need to look at. So I do have some flyers up here as well on the food council. So anyway, um, for people who have questions, please feel free to um, open it up. Yes. I heard something about a new Montgomery County policy or program to try to uh, get grocery stores to be uh, repurposing their food. Is there any of you who know something That's about the that? food the food recovery initiative. The um, the county Valerie Irvin started a working group. Um, Brett and I have been working on that for about eight months. Um, Brett, did you want to talk a little bit about? That? Yeah. So uh, Mana works with several grocery stores in the county. Nourish now works with some grocery stores in the county, and we've been uh, Safeway was has been at a lot of the Montgomery County Food Recovery Working Group meetings, and we're, we're trying to figure out what more can grocery stores do. Like Roots Market just started donating their prepared food to us, so we pick that up every day of the week. Um, you know, it's hard as dairy expires right away and the sell-by date for some items are okay, but some items have to be unfortunately thrown away or composted right away. Um, so we're working on with grocery stores to not just have the produce donate it, uh, also to maybe freeze meats on time, and it's in the process. Um, we'll hopefully have an answer shortly, but uh, we're all working together and it's really nice to see the business community excited to, you know, expand what they're already doing. One of the limiting factors that we have 
is a lack of refrigeration <clears throat> and freezing. Um, so for example, you may have a grocery store that has five pallets of carrots that they're bringing to Safeway, um, but they're labeled incorrectly. And so they throw them out because they want to go, the distributor needs to rush to get the next thing so that they get paid. So what we would like to do is um, place a large walk-in refrigerator freezer somewhere close to the 95-495 connector um, so that we can garner the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and, and that's really where the grocery stores are, are coming into play. So um, a lot of that is, uh, in my, this Montgomery County, finding space. Uh, so we're looking at several sites to be able to, to do that. Abby? Um, just one issue to bring up um, that you mentioned briefly was um, the whole confusion about um, dating of products that you buy in the stores. Um, there's the sell by date and the use by date and the, I don't know, there's a variety of different dates and many of them don't ha really have much meaning at all. I don't know if there's, some, if there's I mean, that's, a, I guess, a national a national issue, but it might be something to work on, too. Well, um, it's one of the things that we're looking at, and actually, I got involved in composting. I was trained by um, Will Allen in Milwaukee, who's actually grew up as a sharecropper on Montrose Road in Rockville, and um, I was watching, I took him, you know, he took me on one of his, his composting runs, and there was stuff he was throwing on that compost heap that was, you know, looked better than the stuff that was in my refrigerator that I was feeding my family. And, um, so the idea of repurposing and really getting engaged with a commercial kitchen that we can utilize seconds, um, a lot of it is just the finances of bringing it together. So we want to support, you know, unlike working in our silos, we want to make sure that, so for example, the White Oak um, Community Center has this wonderful new community center with a huge teaching commercial kitchen, and it's rented a lot, but they're giving us one day a week. So, and then Janet from Hollywood East Restaurant is giving us 75 pounds of organic cage-free chicken carcasses every week. So we're going to be making bone broth and then whatever is left over, you know, I'm sure we'll have a lot of butternut squash soup coming through. Um, probably a lot. <laughs> um, no soup. No soup for you. Okay. Um, I actually today was, um, we're new to the area, you've already heard this, but, <laughs> but we're new to the area and um, didn't know there was a farmer's market here. We came actually for Green Fest, so we went to the farmer's market and um, I went to a booth and there we bought some apples and there was a language, to be a language barrier, the um, customer spoke primarily Spanish and used um, what looked, what I was pretty clearly some um, federal government subsidy payment method. Um, and there was kind of a like, how much is it, $10 sort of language barrier exchange, um, and it wasn't a problem. But um, it seemed to me that they didn't weren't aware of the matching program that y'all offer. How, what kind of community outreach is done on that matching program? Sure. Um, so, because uh, I think it, like that's not something that was available at the last farmers market where we live. Right. I think it's phenomenal. And so I, we actually. Um, we have a great um, outreach coordinator at market every Saturday, uh, Rosa Sanchez, who probably people in the room actually know she works for Montgomery County. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I think human resources, but so she actually uh, processes applications at market for um, you know anybody that wants to see if they qualify or she can walk you through it. Um, so that's what that's the kind of stuff we do at market and. Rosa is like a, it's, you know, snap whisperer. Like she goes to laundry market, <laughs> laundry mat, she goes to bus stops. Like it's amazing, and she does like I think she processed over 500 applications last year. Um, she did, yes, yeah, she averaged like 11 a market, and we're open year round. So, and and the individual, the shopper who actually did, um, who used their coupons, they probably they probably knew about it because what we do with the coupons is that they use the coupons, then we give them a receipt, and they come back to our booth. And we just had to do that because the seniors were actually just reusing coupons. So we just had to, we had to put a step in there to make sure that they weren't, you know, just reusing that. But um, that's what we do in, in Silver Spring. And I, you know, if, if you want to talk offline, give you Rosa's information. Or if you want to volunteer or, or help out, um, we're always looking for volunteers. So, no, seriously, we don't, we couldn't do anything that we do without volunteers. Like we have... You know, we have one, we have two managers at the market, and then a you know volunteers that show up regularly. If we didn't have them, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to run the market. So we run off volunteers. Oh, one of the things I wanted to mention too, um, James, I brought it up at one of the last um, meetings that we had was as far as trying to source local food. One of the problems we have in Montgomery County is that the farmers here really grow enough so that they can sell retail, and they're not growing enough that they 
can actually sell to a, you know to a wholesale market for restaurants. So that's something. I don't know, Caroline, if there's a, a you yeah. know, the producers lister if you want to. Sure. Keep it up. One more question. This is a comment as much as a question. The contrast between the, uh, the big picture, the WRI, uh, big picture, and what we've heard is is really striking. And it would be very powerful, I think, if there were a way in the setting of the market or even of some of the other institutions that people could become more aware of Janet's message at the macro scale and then conversely if at the macro scale there could become more awareness of the micro scale otherwise it tends to be at conferences where somebody comes in and gives the macro interstellar picture and others who are dealing with people who are in need of food in an hour, or producing on you know, half an acre. So I just think that there's great power in that if you want to think about what, whether at the at the uh, the market itself there could be means of uh, distributing materials about the big picture in case people would want to know more about the big picture. And I'd see the Montgomery County Food Council is putting stuff together to have a macro. Absolutely. We're working on a resources page and also trying to get a list out of all the local farmers and what they grow and have different recipes to be able to use them. So um, please do um, grab brochure on the count on the on the food council. I think it does say it's a, a gmail.org is our email address is gmail.com. Um, the website is a dot org. Um, I like everyone on Facebook, please. Caroline. I got uh, one one more thing. Okay, so we talked about land linking with people in the Ag Reserve. Check it out. There's opportunities to land link elsewhere in the county. There are people who have large lots still closer to urban centers, and that offers an opportunity for producers to get right where their consumer base is. So if you know anybody that has an acre, a half an acre, that they would like to see under, under cultivation, uh, let us know. There's some information here. If you want to start farming even while you're working elsewhere because that's what 80% of the farmers do in this country, then let us know. We'll see whether we can get you on the ground. Right, Doug? Right. We'll publish that. <laughs> Thank you all.